有人成为了星光，有人年过九旬，依然仰望星空。这就是霍金与彭罗斯，他们是一生挚友，也是最默契的伙伴。基于彭罗斯的起点定理，霍金得以解释宇宙大爆炸的秘密。彭罗斯用三页的数学论文，揭示黑洞的形成是广义相对论的普遍预言。他也因此获得2020年诺贝尔物理学奖。如今，他提出共行循环宇宙假说，试图改写宇宙的起源，为人类预言宇宙轮回与不灭的传说。2017年，霍金来到腾讯科学魏大会，带领我们探索宇宙。2021年，我们携手这个时代另一位科学巨人 ，Roger Penrose。共登科学的天梯。Hello, it's my pleasure to talk to We Summit. My name is Roger Penrose. I am an emeritus professor at the University of Oxford, and I am going to talk about black holes, singularities, and cyclic cosmology. Now. My talk will be mainly in space-time, so I will have to talk about four dimensions. You could, here we have a picture of three space dimensions, and going upwards, my time will normally go upwards. We have the fourth dimension, which is time. I also have drawn the light cone. This describes the speed of light. So anything which travels at the speed of light would go along that light cone. You have to imagine that the spatial and temporal dimensions. Are comparable in the sense that if it's seconds for the time dimension, you will have something like light seconds for space, which isn't the normal way of doing it. But you want the speed of light to look something reasonable in the picture. Now, I'm not really concerned with the axes. I'm really concerned with the light cone or the null cone. This describes the speed of light at any point, and this. As you go around space-time, it may not have any regularity because in Einstein's theory. Of space-time general relativity, you have a curved space-time, and so the light cones sort of are not regularly distributed over the whole of space-time. So here you have a picture which shows how they might vary as you go from place to place. In a general way, though, my, the time will be going upwards. Here we have a picture of the Oppenheimer and Snyder collapse. This was J. Robert Oppen Oppenheimer of. Atomic bomb fame later on, but this was in 1939. He and his student Snyder described the collapse of a dust cloud. So the idea was that in general relativity, if you have too much material squashed together in too small a region, then it collapses inwards. And in this particular situation, everything was exactly spherically symmetrical. So no direction in space was singled out above any other. And you have this spherically symmetrical body. The body also was special in that it was what's called dust. That is to say, there's no pressure, so it just collapses inwards, and the density gets more and more and more until it becomes infinite at the center. So this, of course, was regarded by many people as a very artificial picture. There's no pressure to stop it, and everything is symmetrical. So it's got nowhere to go except straight towards the center. So the fact that the density becomes infinite at the center. That means the space-time curvature, according to Einstein's theory, becomes infinite, and this is what's called a singularity, where everything goes wrong. People really did not believe this was a realistic picture, not just because the dust has no pressure, but more importantly, because in a general collapse situation there will be irregularities which will become more and more magnified as you get towards the center. So it was not thought that this was a realistic picture. However, in the early 1960s, people started to find rather strange phenomena. These were what became later known as the quasars. These were objects which sended radio signals of such intensity, more than maybe a thousand times that of an entire galaxy, and also they had to be relatively small. Because they varied at a range which showed that the size of them couldn't be bigger than something like the solar system, this is really extraordinary. How could all that energy be 
squashed into something the size of the solar system. So people began to wonder whether perhaps this Oppenheimer Snyder picture might not be something of what is happening, that the material gets so concentrated that it produces signals and then you maybe have a picture like this. But people didn't really believe in the singularities. Uh, and in fact, there was a paper written by two Russians, Lifshitz and Khalatnikov, who seemed to have proved that in the general situation, when you have irregularities, that the collapse would not be straight towards the center. Maybe it would swish around in a complicated way and come swirling out again. Now, around about that time, I began to worry about these things. And certainly John Wheeler, in Princeton, whom I was working with at the time, was interested in whether this was a general situation. And for various reasons, I had my suspicions that the lifshitz kalatnikov paper that singularities didn't occur was probably maybe not correct. There was a mistake in the paper. I didn't know about the mistake, but uh, I, I wasn't totally convinced by the methods they were using. So I started to think about methods of my own, which looked at looking at sets what looked the future of regions and so on like that. And this picture is from a paper which I wrote in 1964, published in 1965, in which I considered a general collapse. The, it's roughly speaking the Oppenheimer Snyder picture, but I'm considering there's a little ring in the middle, which you have to imagine there's an extra dimension, of course, because it's four space dimensions rather than four space time dimensions rather than three. So you, you have to imagine another dimension. So that thing that looks like a ring is really a sphere. And at the, along that sphere, the point is that the light rays are, are converging inwards. And I proved a theorem which showed that if the light rays start converging inwards, and if the energy doesn't go negative anywhere, then you're going to have a problem. And that you are going to have something like a singularity, quite general. It's not that the symmetry doesn't depend on the symmetry, because I was looking at sit complicated situations where the future of a region could be something like this, and the light rays start crossing over each other and do complicated things. But I was able to develop arguments to show that the once you had this trapped surface, this point of no return and the collapse, that there was no way of avoiding the singularities if you had. Uh, if you didn't have negative energies or something unrealistic of that nature. A lot of people had trouble believing this and they even thought that perhaps this showed that general relativity must be wrong. That was not my view. My view was it really did show that we have things like what we now call a black hole. Now, at the time, this was, as I say, in 1964 when I gave a talk at King's College London on this, um, Dennis Sharma, who was a great friend and colleague of mine in Cambridge, wanted me to give a repeat of this talk. And I did give a repeat in Cambridge. And at the repeat, Stephen Hawking, who was a young graduate student at the time, was present at my repeat lecture in Cambridge, not at the original one, but the repeat lecture in Cambridge. And afterwards, he and I and George Ellis and perhaps Brandon Carter had a long talk about the details of the arguments I was using. Stephen Hawking then generalized these arguments and apply them to the Big Bang. You see, here's another situation where, according to standard cosmology, you have a singularity where the curvatures of space-time go infinite, the densities become infinite, and it looks like a crazy kind of situation. This is at the very beginning of the universe, according to theory, and the, there was evidence that the Big Bang was there. This was the evidence from the microwave background, which seemed to show that it was the very early stage of the universe when things were actually extremely hot and dense, and it did seem to indicate that there was this thing called the Big Bang. Now, maybe the Big Bang was not, as you see here, in all my pictures, as I try to indicate, time is going up the picture, so you have to imagine that the bottom is the Big Bang with a great explosion which creates the universe. Does it have to be this very special, singular, regular situation that the theories that people use, the models that cosmologists all use, assume exact symmetry. What happens if you have a general situation with all sorts of irregularities? And that's what Stephen Hawking looked at. Later on, we got together and wrote a paper on this together. But most of the work on this end was done by him, developing the arguments which I had used for the collapse of black holes. Now, I began to worry about this because what happens in a general collapse? You see, here is the 
very symmetrical Big Bang. Why is it going to be symmetrical? Why not irregularities? But what happens in this collapse? Suppose we imagine a collapsing model of the universe with time still going upwards and there are irregularities. Now these irregularities will cause black holes. These black holes will congeal with each other, provide bigger and bigger black holes, more and more terrible singularities, an enormous mess of a singularity, nothing like the kind of thing we saw at the beginning. You have an incredibly complicated, and this is where the Russians also now corrected their mistake and found that in general you did get very, very complicated singularities in the future. Now what is so different from that, whereas in the past we don't get the time reverse of what we expect to see in the generic collapse in the future, the great mess that you see in this picture here, you get something very regular, which is uh, apparently what we see. Now what is the difference between the situation in the future and that in the past? Well mainly it's because something called the vile curvature is dominates in the future and doesn't in the past. Here I have a picture somebody at the future of this picture looking back this is the past light cone of a point and the light rays become distorted by the presence of vile curvature and the presence of Ricci curvature that's according to Einstein equations the Ricci curvature is what's created by the matter and the vile curvature is what is the free gravity so the gravitational field is um, described by this vile curvature and the matter is described by the Ricci curvature. Now the Ricci curvature is a sort of regular inwards focusing in all directions whereas the vile curvature gives you this great distortion. And what seems to be the case is that in the remote future one has a dominating uh, vile curvature whereas the vile curvature seems not to be present in the very early universe. Now this is very much related to the second law of thermodynamics. Now here I have a picture of how the se second law of thermodynamics um, operates. The top three pictures describe, say, a gas in a box where we have a smaller box and all the material is constrained in this, into this little corner. You open up the box and it spreads out through the, the box. So from left to right we see the increasing of time and the increasing of entropy and we get a much more uniform situation as entropy increases. So that's the way ordinary matter seems to behave. But how about gravity? In the bottom three pictures, we have on the left-hand side at the bottom, we have a, uh, maybe imagine a very big box of a galactic scale box with many, many stars. Initially, you might imagine they're all uniformly spread out, but as gravity starts to operate, they clump together and form clumpy distributions, and finally you get collapsed into a black hole where the entropy goes just shooting up enormously. So as entropy increases with gravity, the irregularities increase, whereas with ordinary matter, you expect the uniformity to be the situation with increasing entropy. So the real puzzle is, why is it that in the very early universe you see uniformity which was consistent with very high entropy but on the other hand very low gravitational entropy. Very high entropy in the matter, and that's what we tend to see, but very low gravitational entropy. And I thought this was a great puzzle. So I formulated a sort of hypothesis that for some strange reason the singularities in the future had to be zero vile curvature, whereas the singularities, sorry, the singularities in the past had to have this zero vile curvature, whereas the singularities in the future, the vile curvature could absolutely go wild and dominate. And I, like everybody else, seem to think this must be a feature of quantum gravity. You see, when the curvatures get very, very big, then you start to imagine that quantum effects will start to play a role. It's not just classical Einstein theory. When the radius of curvature becomes so, so small, maybe say um, 10 orders smaller magnitude than the radius of a proton or something like that, it's the sort of scale in which you might expect that you have um, quantum gravity playing a big role. But what's so strange about it is if this is the case, why is it that the 
quantum gravity seems to behave so differently from the past type singularity, where the vial curvature seems to be zero or very close to zero, whereas in the future singularities it seems to dominate and go crazy. Now, for a long time I seem to think this must be a very strange kind of quantum gravity where gravity is changing the very structure of quantum mechanics. Now, I do actually believe that. There is a great puzzle about quantum mechanics, which is called the measurement problem, which is not really explained in standard quantum mechanics. And it is my belief that when you bring gravity in, it's going to resolve that problem. So for a long time, I thought, well, this very strange quantum gravity, where gra gravity behaves very differently from everything else, maybe that's the explanation. But then I had a different idea. It's really very hard to make that work, and I was, wasn't certain, certainly was not able to make it work. Let me go back to the picture of the light curve. And now l let me make it a little bit more complete. You see, that picture just described the light cones, the null cones. It did not describe how time is be behaves in, in general relativity. You see, time features here we have two of the most famous formulae of 20th century physics. There's Einstein's E equals mc squared, of course, and also Max Planck's E equals h nu. Max Planck's formula tells us that energy and frequency are equivalent. Einstein's formula tells us that energy and mass are equivalent. Put the two together, that tells you mass and frequency are equivalent. So when you have mass, you have automatically a frequency. So every mass is a clock. So when you want to bring clocks in, the rate of time, you, that's what mass does for you. If you have no mass, you wouldn't have clocks. But if you do have mass, that determines these little um, hill and bowl-shaped surfaces that I've introduced into the light cones tell you the ticks of a clock. And here we have two particles whizzing at different speeds, but they're related by these surfaces which tell you when the first tick happens, the second tick, and so on. But if you just had light-like particles, in other words, photons and things like that, who don't notice the, these surfaces at all, they don't register the passage of time, particles without mass don't even know about the passage of time, they only know about the light cones. So this was a remarkable thing, which seemed to me to be important. It's also true of Maxwell's equations, which describe the, the classical behavior of light, and these equations are completely insensitive to the scale. They just care about the light cones. They don't care about the scale. Now what happens when you just have the light cones? You don't have the scale, but you massless particles, things without mass, that's what they're interested in. Well, it's very interesting because when you don't have any scale, you can consider a kind of geometry which is called conformal geometry. Conformal geometry is the geometry of small shapes, if you like, of angles. And here we have a lovely picture due to the Dutch artist M.C. Escher, where he shows with a certain type of geometry, it's called hyperbolic geometry, don't worry about that. But the important thing about this geometry is that you can represent infinity. This circular boundary to this picture represents the infinity of these creatures. So the creatures in Escher's picture, they don't feel the boundary there, they, they, the mass keeps them uh, so they actually know where they are, if you like. They know that how big they are. But if they were massless, they could r go right out of the boundary and they wouldn't notice any difference from anywhere else. If they were photons, the photons could probe the boundary and go right through and seem to explore some world outside infinity. Very strange idea, but if there were no mass, that's the sort of picture which makes sense. So I began to think about this. And when we talk about the whole universe, it was discovered... Uh, at the turn of the century, more or less, that there is something, sometimes people call it dark energy. I call it Einstein's cosmological constant. He introduced it in 1917 for the wrong reason, nevertheless. But it seems to be the best explanation for what's happening in the remote future. Here we have a picture um, of the universe uh, in its expansion. The remote future is this exponential expansion where this dark energy or cosmological constant seems to dominate and we have the Big Bang at the bottom of the picture and the feature of this is we can apply, apply the trick that Escher used in his picture and squash down infinity and make it into a finite boundary. If you only have photons running around then they won't notice the difference and you can squash it down into a finite boundary. What about the Big Bang? 
Well, the idea is you could stretch that out into a finite boundary as well. You might worry, well, there's a lot of massive particles running around the Big Bang, so surely they know how big the universe is. No, they don't really, because it's so hot, so dense, and so hot at the Big Bang that they rush around so fast that the mass of particles becomes completely irrelevant. And again, you have a situation where, in effect, everything is without mass. It's not actually without mass, but the mass is so unimportant at the Big Bang because the energy is so big that the energy of the particles is in their motion, according to Einstein's theory, in their motion and not in the mass of the individual particles. So they behave like massless things too. So you can apply the trick at the beginning and stretch out the Big Bang and make it into something nice and smooth. And you can squash down infinity and make it nice, something nice and smooth. Now the advantage about this is that you can only stretch out the Big Bang and making it smooth in very, very special circumstances. My former student and colleague Paul Todd used this as a, rather than using my vial curvature hypothesis, saying the vial curvature is zero, a better way of doing it was to say you could stretch out the Big Bang and make it nice and smooth. So I liked his way of doing it. It's a much better way. And moreover, you could do something more. You can say that the remote future, well, is that the end? Or can you imagine that the remote future extends into something else? What about the Big Bang? Maybe you can imagine that extends backwards into something else. So this was the picture that modifying Paul Todd's idea into one where the vial curvature is actually zero at the beginning and not just finite as he had. You can imagine that this Big Bang was actually the ex continuation of something before. So I'm saying that why the Big Bang was so special was because it is the conformal continuation of something, the remote future. You might say this is very hard to imagine because how could something so cold and rarefied in the remote future be physically like something so hot and dense? But when you think about it, it's not so strange because when you have no mass around, it can't tell the difference between big and small, it therefore can't tell the big difference between hot and cold. You see, when you squash down this very rarefied remote future, it becomes hotter. When you stretch out the very hot and dense Big Bang, it becomes colder. And they seem to match. So the, the model I'm putting forward, a crazy model, but nevertheless, it seems to make a lot of sense. That you stretch out the Big Bang, and then it becomes the continuation of the remote future of a previous eon. So in this picture, what we used to think is the entire universe, the Big Bang being, being the beginning and the remote future being the end, I'm saying that this is just one eon, one stage of a perhaps infinite succession of eons, one after the other. Now, it's also, you see, when I first thought of this idea about 15 years ago or so, I thought I'd go and lecture about this forever. Nobody will ever be able to contradict me because there's no observations against it. But then I thought, well, maybe there are, are observations because signals can get through. If these signals are light signals, if they, more importantly, are gravitational signals, they can get through. And I thought about if you have collapse, uh, if you have uh, black holes, which spiral into each other and huge galactic scale black holes. I'm not talking about the ones that LIGO sees and the, we certainly see black holes running into each other, but the black holes at centers of galaxies, absolutely enormous ones, eventually will start to spiral into each other and produce signals which maybe we could see. There are also other effects which we can see and it seems to be the case that there are signals that we are seeing in the early cosmic microwave background, which are explicable, and only, only explicable as far as I can see, in terms of something going on before the Big Bang, which is consistent with the picture which I've just been showing you. It's something for the future to see whether these things continue to support this idea, or do we see effects which contradict the idea. I think it's very exciting because it opens up n new things in cosmology, which, we, which hadn't been thought of before. Thank you very much.